Good morning, um, I'm Dorothy Winfall. Um, by day, I'm a project leader at TWI, and by night, I'm finishing off my thesis um, with Brunel University. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of my research on high strength stills at elevated temperatures. So, in a future of scarce raw materials in an energy crisis, it will be both uneconomical un and irresponsible to employ materials other than those offering their maximum potential. Um, so that's a quote from Frederick Brian Prickering um, back in 1975. Um, he's a metallurgist and he was um, really influential in doing fundamental research which has shaped the stills that we currently use um, in the construction industry. Um, in our time, I guess the energy crisis is being addressed with renewable energy. Um, but one of the main threats is still um, focusing on sustainable, sustainable engineering, so being able to meet the future demands without compromising on what we need today. Um, and in particular, um, it's rapid urban popular, um, rapid urbanisation. So the UN predicts that by 2050, there'll be potentially an extra 2.5 billion people in urban areas. Um, so that, coupled with scarce material resources, makes us think what. Um, what we could use to potentially um, build structures. And this is where high strength stills um, comes in. So definition of high strength stills is uh, materials um, with the yield strength greater than um, 460 megapascals. And um, in the Euro codes, there are supplementary design guidelines um, which expand upon what's currently used for um, conventional steel grades. Um, and that was introduced in 2007. Um, and there are countless examples of materials that do utilize high strength stills, including the Phoenix International Media Center in Beijing, China. Now, um, there are lots of benefits of utilizing high strength stills over conventional. The main is the increase in the strength to weight ratio. So that means that you can use, potentially use less material to carry the same load bearing capacity. Um, with lighter structures, you need a smaller foundation, so there's less disruption to the ground. Also, you have smaller cross sections, so they're um, easier to put up and put together, um, quicker to weld and inspect, um, but also there's uh, low association in um, carbon emissions in terms of producing less material, but also transporting lighter materials. Um, but there are some challenges related to using high strength stills. Um, a lot of them are being addressed and particularly increasing the strength, but um, instability becomes quite critical um, because of Young's modulus is the same, but also the behavior at elevated temperatures, which is what my research is focused on. So um, aims of my research, but also the aims of this presentation is to explore um, the material properties and the buckling properties of different types of high strength stills at elevated temperature. So in terms of material, there are many different ways to produce high strength stills, all related to its heat treatment, but also what's in it. Um, and so the first still is still A, and that's just a quench and tempered still, nominal yield strength of 690, and it came in plate form. Still C, which is also quench and tempered and has the exact same um, heat treatment parameters, but just looking at the microstructure, it's very different, and the difference is related to actually what's in the still um, in terms of its chemical composition. And still A is alloyed with slightly more chromium molybdenum, while still C um, is alloyed with um, microalloying elements, so that's niobium, vanadium, and titanium. Um, so then we have still B, which is a thermomechanically controlled process still, and in this case it gets a strength related to, again, its heat treatment, but also its alloyed of microalloying elements. And then still D, um, which is a normalized still, it's in structural hollow form, it's maximum strength using a normalized heat treatment that you can attain is 460 megapascals. So to get the material properties, you normally just pull the material, do a tensile test, um, so tensile tests were done at room temperature, and that's to get the baseline. But also it was done at elevated temperature, which is again just doing, um, just introducing furnace. And then you get your stress strain response. So the properties of interest are, so Young's modulus, which is the initial linear elastic part of the curve, um, the 0.2% proof strength, which is um, normally used as the nominal yield. And then in fire, um, we also use what's known as the effective yield strength. And in this case, it's the strength of the material at 2% total strain. Um, so it's a lot higher strains than you would use at 
um, for ambient temperature design. Um, but the reason for this is, in a fire, what you really care about is making sure that your building is standing and that everyone can evacuate. So you don't really care too much about what happens um, post-fire. So for the room temperature, um, the strains used were based on a recommendation from Hearing and Young, and they're much, uh, it's a much slower strain rate than what's um, specified in the standards, and this is just to generate um, a lot of data points to determine the Young's modulus. Um, two methods were used to measure the strain. There's strain gauges, um, which are suitable up to 2% strain, um, but also an extensometer was used to um, get the strain for the entire stress-strain curve. And this is just the stress strain responses for the material, and you can see how different they all are, and that is, again, related to how it was made. So elevated temperature, exactly the same setup. The only difference now is that the strain gauge has been replaced um, with thermocouples just to monitor the top, middle, and bottom of the, um, of the specimen. And there are two ways to... To, um, to get material properties. The first method is the most common, and that's isothermal conditions. That just means that the temperature is the same. So you'd heat up the specimen to a constant temperature, and then you'll conduct um, the test. So the strain rate used was just based on the recommendations given in the standards. The second method um, is the anisothermal conditions. Now, in this case, um, you'll first um, load your specimen to a constant load and then increase the temperature. And this method is considered to be more representative of, I guess, what a structure would go through in a fire. And the heating rates that tend to be used can vary between five degrees per minute, which represents um, a structure that's been insulated, to 50 degrees per minute, which represents um, a structure with no fire protection at all. And um, another benefit of using this method is that creep influences are implicitly accounted for, depending on what heating rate you use. So both methods were used um, to get the material properties for the selected steels. So this is just the um, stress strain response um, from the isothermal conditions. And um, so for the anisothermal, you end up with um, a strain measured as a function of the temperature. And that can be converted into a stress strain response just by looking at the different loads and then getting the strains and then manually and going back that way. Um, so this method is, requires a lot more method, um, a lot more steps compared to the isothermal um, conditions, which is probably one reason why it's less used. And this is just um, the full stress strain response for the anisothermal for stills A and B. So, We've got the material properties, and the way the Euro code presents the data is as reduction factors. So that's just the material at selected temperature normalized by what its property would be at room temperature. So that was done for the 0.2% proof strength. So we see um, the data and see that the Euro code is generally um, conservative with respect to the reduction factors for the stills, apart from around 100 below 100 degrees. Um, Compare it with the literature, we see that there's quite a bit of scatter. And the same thing with the effective yield strength. The Euro code is generally conservative at temperatures greater than 400 degrees. Um, and again, there is a great scatter. And the scatter is probably related to the testing parameters that other researchers have used, but also the material histories of the steel. Um, it suggests, so the Euro code itself is based on the reduction factors for conventional steel grades. So that's still grades of yield strength um, less than 355 megapascals. And it's the lower bound results to suggest that perhaps for high strength stills, maybe a lower reduction curve is needed to um, consider considering the worst case scenario. But doing that could penalize stills that do have a better um, strength retention property. So it does think about perhaps maybe grouping stills um, based on how it's been produced rather than specifying one reduction curve for all materials. So for the elastic modulus, we have the reduction factors again. And with this, um, again, with the literature, there is a great scatter. And this is actually believed to be more related, not so much with the material history, because um, Young's modulus is quite consistent regardless of how um, the material has been made. So it's perhaps more the experimental method. Um, for the anisothermal method, because creep 
is included, that could result in a lower Young's modulus because you're normalizing them by, um, by more strains. So for that reason, you would tend to end up with lower reduction curves um, for anisothermal um, methods. And that's one reason why the Eurocode approach um, is overly conservative for some of the selected steels. So after getting the material properties, it's then utilizing it to, to see, okay, how does this actually influence um, the buckling response at elevated temperatures? So um, a numerical model was made in Abacus, um, shell elements were used, and the mesh was equal to the thickness of the cross section, which section area. The boundary conditions um, for slender, they were just pinned, and for stub columns, they were restrained. And the material properties were utilized um, from um, the material properties measured um, from the isothermal test results, and they were um, transformed into true plastic strain and stress um, as specified by the applicants. Residual stresses were not considered in this case and for the load response it was the modified BRICS method that was used. So to validate the model, um, two experimental methods were used and there's currently no data available um, for high strength stills at elevated temperature. So um, tests for high strength stills at ambient temperature done um, by Wang Gardner were modelled, and in this case their end conditions were pinned. The second model that was used um, was based on elevated temperature tests on conventional steel grades, so steel grade S355. They did, they modelled, um, they did experimental um, tests on columns that were modelled isothermally, so that was at 400, 550, 700 degrees. For the stub columns, the end conditions were fixed, um, and for the long columns that were pinned, so the validation results, um, you see that the models is pretty good at um, predicting what the buckling mode would be. But one main thing about using um, Abacus is just being able to actually tr um, trace the load deflection response. Um, for Wang and Gardner, it's pretty good. And then for elevated temperatures, um, it's not bad. So after... Um, after the validation, the model was then used to do parametric studies, and the cross-section that was chosen was class one. And the material properties were taken from stills A and B. Um, for global imperfections, that was just the length over a thousand, and for geometric imperfections, Dawson and Walker model was used. End conditions were pinned, and they were modeled under isothermal conditions. So the results were then compared using the Eurocode approach so the Eurocode buckling reduction factors um, is just, so we've got your buckling um, resistance, which is just your buckling load normalized by your squash load. And that's um, modeled again, and that's plotted against um, your non-dimensional slenderness, which is just what your slenderness value would be at room temperature, um, taking into account the reduction factors, for the effective yield strength and the elastic modulus that was presented earlier. So these are the two buckling curve responses um, that you get for still A and still B, and you can see that they are quite different, particularly when the non slenderness dimensionless value is less than 1.5. Um, for below 1.5, um, for above 1.5, you can see that they're quite similar, and that's because the columns will buckle um, in the elastic part of your stress strain response. So that's quite similar for both materials. Um, but for below 1.5, um, it will buckle in the part where the stress strain curve will um, transit from the linear to the nonlinear part. So looking back to stress strain responses, both still A and still B, um, it is influenced by the roundness or the curvature of the stress strain response, and that's described using the strain hardening parameter. So for still A, it's found that the strain hardening parameter varied from 8 to 100, so 100 representing an almost bilinear stress strain response, um, so that's what's at 20 degrees, um, whilst around 800 degrees, the strain hardening parameter was around 8. For still B, it's quite consistent, the shape of the stress strain response, and that's probably related to why there's less scatter in the buckling and coefficients for still B compared to still A. So another thing about buckling um, of the columns is, so in the Eurocode, the effective yield strength is, is used, but um, stiffness, well, buckling is controlled by stiffness, Young's modulus, and that does decrease rapidly um, past the 0.2% hoof strength rather than the effective yield strength. So it does 
ask or raise the questions of whether the 0.2% proof of is more suitable um, for, der um, for deriving the buckling um, reduction factors. So in this case, I've just replaced the effective yield strength um, with the 0.2% proof strength. So the results for still A, um, you can see that for below 1.5, um, 800 degrees was slightly, was unconservative, but has shifted upwards and it does um, better predict um, the buckling reduction factors. And for still B, um, it finds that for all the buckling reduction factors, they pretty overlap quite nicely, um, suggesting that also perhaps a single, the single buckling curve um, approach for different temperatures is, is suitable. So just to summarize, there are various ways to produce high strength stills. Um, for, to get yield strengths as high as 700, you use quenching tempered and thermal cloud controlled processing routes. Um, and this in turn, it does lead to a wide variety of material properties at elevated temperature and it raises questions of whether using a single reduction um, factor is appropriate in the Euro codes or whether it's worth grouping it based on how the material has been produced and perhaps also what's in it in terms of its alloying elements. Um, in turn, it's fine that of course the material properties influence the buckling response, particularly um, at non-dimensional slenderness less than one. Out of the still grades tested, still B had the best strength retention properties. And this again is believed to be related to what's in the still. Um, I have done microstructural studies to look at this further and um, there was evidence of hardening happening around 500 and 600 degrees, which led to a delay in strength at elevated temperature. Um, so the Eurocode reduction factors, it can be unconservative. Um, that was seen for the effective yield strength, the 0.2% proof strength, as well as the... Okay. Um, the Eurocode is generally conservative in terms of um, predicting the buckling reduction factors um, for still B. Um, maybe a slightly lower buckling curve is needed for still A. Um, the point two is slightly better buckling parameter um, than the effective yield strength. But to really um, be able to give design guidelines for high strength stills, um, a more comprehensive data set is needed, especially with the buckling reduction factors. I've only given an example for two stills, still A and still B. Um, but there are many other stills that you've seen that have different um, material properties that should be considered. And on that note, thank you very much.